Good evening. God bless you, and thank you for joining us online. Uh, by the way, we shoot this on a Tuesday night at 7.15 p.m., and you would be welcome to join us. Would you just bow your heads with me? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, bring your word from this page, from the pages of history into today. Let it touch the hearts and the minds of your people and let them be strengthened and draw encouragement for the day is drawing near. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So last week we ended up with Daniel saving his life and the life of his three amigos. And right on the precipice of biblical prophecy. I thought about this quite a lot this week. You see, there are many holy books. A holy book is just a book that somebody considers different to all other books, separate and aside. And every cult has them. Every religion has them. So what makes you think yours is any better than anyone else's? Now, I'm usually very careful about using the word like better because I know full well that we are forgiven, not better. Amen. But when it comes to our Bible, there most certainly is a level at which it is significantly better. It is the very words of God. And at least one of the things that sets our Bible apart from all other holy books is its accurate ability to predict the future. By the way, we also have manuscript evidence. We have literally tens of thousands of manuscripts. And on top of that, we have the geologi uh, geographical and geological evidence for example, if the Bible talks about a particular city and they go to that location and dig down, they'll find that city. Archaeology is unveiling the Bible every single day. So much so that there are literally magazines out there. Uh, well, back in the day when there was magazines, now it's all online. But there are websites and groups and, that are literally dedicated to biblical archaeology because they keep finding new stuff all the time. So these factual things set your Bible apart from every other holy book. Now with that in mind, we're about to approach, approach the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe some of you saw the movie Vacation with Chevy Chase. And in it, he forcibly took his family on vacation. And when they got to the Grand Canyon, he opens the door of the station wagon and everybody has to get out. And he stands there and they peer over the edge into the Grand Canyon. And they all pile back into the car and carry on. Well, we are peering over the edge of the history future. We're peering into a time that nobody could know. Yesterday, there was a great win for the conservatives in Alberta. But I knew many, many Christians that were very concerned that they might lose. But you know, God knew in advance who was going to win. And what you're going to see tonight is he not only knows who is going to win an election, he knew thousands of years in advance who would be the world powers? Try predicting who's going to be the next world power. Take your Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter 2, verse 24. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, 
and I will interpret his dream for him. And Eric took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. And the king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? And Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he's asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you lay on your bed are these. As you're lying there, O king, your mind turned to things to come. And the revealer of mysteries showed you what's going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom other than any other living men, but so that you, O king, may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. You were looking, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver and its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And while you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were broken into pieces at the same time and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them all away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and fulfilled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it for the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you the, domin me, the dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed mankind, the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. After you, another kingdom will rise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom of bronze will rule over the whole earth. And finally, there'll be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, for iron smashes or breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet of the, and the toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. Just as you saw the iron mixed with clay, so the people will be a mixture and not retain and not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to, another, to other people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of a rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke 
the iron and bronze and clay and silver and gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and the interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered him, ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. And the king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords and the revealer of mysteries. For you are able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him and made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its wise men. Moreover, at the king's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel, Daniel himself remained in the royal court. And there's the vision. There's the dream. Let's have a close look at this. Just come back, if you will, to verse 24. Then Daniel went to Arioch. Now, Arioch's name means lion-like. It's an Aramaic name. And you can see he's obviously, by the name that he's been given, he's an aggressive leader of the household of Nebuchadnezzar. He's lion-like. Not one to wait in line pleasantly. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, do not execute the wise men of Babylon. By the way, wouldn't have this have been a great opportunity to get rid of the cultists? Wouldn't this have been fabulous to just let them all be killed? And isn't it interesting, the heart of Daniel, to save these men? You know, sometimes we write people off because they're not Christians yet. But maybe we should be a little bit careful with that. We know that a group of these men, or maybe their descendants after them, are going to show up three years after Jesus is born. They're the wise men from the East. And they're going to bring the gifts and so on. He says here, do not execute the wise men of Babylon in the end, if you remember, which I just read a moment ago. He becomes the chief magi. He's the chief in charge of these cultists. What an amazing position for a Bible believer to be in. He had the opportunity to share the, the Torah with them. He had the opportunity to bring them to the truth. And some obviously came because they show up after the birth of Christ following a star because they know very well what Genesis says, that a star will rise in Jacob. And so they're looking for a star to rise over Jacob. And when they see it, they know it's time to start going, and they begin to book it all the way over to Israel. Don't execute them. Take me to the king, and I'll interpret the dream for him. And Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles of, <coughs> of Judah who can tell uh, the king what his dream means. And the king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what my dream, uh, my, t pardon me, tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? And Daniel replied, no wise man or enchanter, diviner or, or magician can explain to the king the mystery he's asked about, and Daniel's right. How would you know what somebody else dreamt? How could you possibly know that? But there is a God in heaven who is able to reveal mysteries. Amen. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. 
Nebuchadnezzar has been given a window into the future. This is straight science fiction. It's as though he's looking through a time portal itself and he's able to see the kingdoms that will come. Of course, for us, we have but one kingdom we're interested in. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you lay on the bed are these. As you were laying there, O king, your mind turned to things to come. And the revealer of mysteries showed you what's going to happen. Have you ever wondered what happens to everything left behind when you're not here? Can you imagine being Nebuchadnezzar, having built, now let's be more clear, having rebuilt the city of Babylon. Babylon starts out as Babel, the Tower of Babel. God comes down and he's angry. And he confuses their languages. And over the thousands of years, Babel becomes rubble. But it also becomes the city of Babylon and it's built and conquered, built and conquered, built and conquered so many times until a man by the name of Nebo Pelazar comes along. And Nebo Pelazar is a great builder. And he will come along and literally rebuild the Babylonian kingdom and specifically the city of Babylon. Now I've told you in the past about the blue gate of Ishtar. And if you ever get a chance to see it, take the opportunity. And if you can't travel, then go online and type it in, Gate of Ishtar. You'll be knocked over at how spectacularly beautiful it is. But what I've never told you in the past is how much gold was in this city. It was literally the city of gold. There's a reason why we have the gold standard. There's a reason why we use silver as money. And there's a reason why copper was used as well. It comes out of these kingdoms. Watch as we develop this. Not because I have greater wisdom than other living men, but so that you, O king, may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. You looked, O king, and there before you was a large statue, an enormous dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold. Its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron and feet, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And while you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. And then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were broken into pieces at the same time and became like chaff on a threshing floor, uh, uh, threshing floor in the summer. And the wind swept them away without leaving a trace. Now, I, I, I suggested to you a couple of weeks ago that you Bing or Google or however you want to look one of the search engines, look up some of the pictures of Babylon. What you're going to discover is there isn't even a stand there to buy a Coca-Cola. There's no souvenir store. It's absolute smashed rubble. If you could bring one of the Babylonians forward in time to today, 
and show them that, they would be as dumbfounded as you would if it was Vancouver. Maybe some of you are old enough to remember a movie called Planet of the Apes. I think we perhaps live there now. But in that, the spaceship from Earth crashes, and when they get out, you see the Statue of Liberty half in the water and the ocean, and all that we knew completely destroyed and gone. That's exactly what's happened right here. Well, it says the wind will sweep them away and without a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, I told you last week that one of the reasons why critics of Daniel consider that it could not have been written by Daniel is that what I'm going to describe to you next is simply so accurate, so completely accurate, that for that to be real, huh, it would have to be supernatural. And after all, we know God doesn't exist. Well, they think that. There are many theologians out there, by the way, that do not believe in God. I don't know if you realize that. There are many, not a few, many, that literally do not believe in God at all. But they are theologically trained, and they're able to pass on what we would consider some Bible truths, but they don't believe in God or the supernatural. When I first got into the ministry, a very interesting thing happened. The Reader's Digest bought out a Bible. That went well, as you can tell. And what they did is they sat down in their grand wisdom and they removed out of the New Testament everything they thought shouldn't be there, specifically any miracle, because there just really couldn't be any miracles. It, that just had to be added later or, or put in by people that were crazy. Well, their Bible didn't sell well. I don't think you can buy one anymore. Maybe on eBay. I wouldn't waste a penny on it. And so when these kinds of people are faced with solid evidence that the miraculous is real, how are they going to process that? And what you're going to read next or hear next is the solid evidence that has caused the critics to come along and say, this had to be written afterwards. We have evidence it was written before and that it was in fact written by Daniel. The head of gold. Well, as I said, Babylon was known as the golden city. Everything in that city the walls, the citadels, the towers were inlaid in gold. Absolutely, spectacularly beautiful. Herodotus, 90 years after Nebuchadnezzar, came along and was blown away by the fact that the buildings of Babylon were simply covered in gold. That was in 539 B.C. When God said to Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold, it really was true. Everything in his kingdom was covered in gold. But then, and we're going to get to this in future chapters, his kingdom comes to an end. One of his descendants is on the throne and he begins to mock the things of God and a hand appears on the wall. And they will write, Mini, Mini, Tikal, Parsen. Your kingdom has been weighed and divided. And it was then given in that night to another group called the Medes and the Persians. You know them today. 
They are those that live in Iran and Iraq. They are the Persians. More Iraq than Iran, believe it or not. And the Medes, you know them as well. They are what we today call the Kurds. And boy, you want to read what the scripture has to say about the Medes and how God is going to stir the Medes up against the Persians. Uh, it, it's, it's very remarkable. Saddam Hussein went in with chemical weapons and he bombed the Kurdish cities and he killed tens of thousands of them and they hated him. It was the Kurds that showed the Americans where everything was, did the interpretation for them, and assisted America in taking down Saddam Hussein. Starts back here. The chest and arms will be silver. Now you're gonna see something interesting here. You're gonna see that the metals will go from softer to harder. Some of the softest metal in the world is gold. Once you get to iron, uh, it's, it's very hard metal, very hard and very brittle, by the way. But not only is it getting harder, it's getting cheaper. Gold is the most expensive. The next is silver. Another kingdom inferior to yours, the Word of God says. In this particular kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, the king was no longer the supreme ruler. There was a government beneath him that had so much power that if they passed some rules, they were called the nobles, if the nobles passed a law, the king had to abide by it. And it would be commonly said, and is still said today, the laws of the Medes and the Persians. You'll find a lot of this particularly when you get into the book of Esther, where the laws of the Medes and the Persians, a law had been passed, and it must now be carried out. Eventually the king says, well, I can't, I can't go against that, I can't break that, uh, but I can pass another law equal to it, and perhaps even supremely uh, uh, over it. I'll give you all the power to fight back. How does that sound? Find that in the book of Esther. The laws of the Medes and the Persians. The nobles were very powerful. See, the difference here was Nebuchadnezzar's golden kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar was the final authority. If he said you die, you die. In fact, you were dead before you hit the floor. But now we've come to the next kingdom that's taken over the same city. They took it over in a night. You're going to love that when we get there. Just a chapter or two away. And now there is a king, but there's a parliament beneath him that has the real power. And so it's a kingdom inferior to Nebuchadnezzar's. Therefore, it's the silver kingdom. The standard of value, and it was their medium of exchange, noted for its amazing tax system. And one of their kings by the name of Xerxes was noted for having a million man foot army. Now, I guess just having a million foot soldiers isn't the most amazing thing in the world. Look at what China has. Look at what India could bring. But imagine having to feed them, clothe them, shelter them, and pay them. And you get to have some understanding of what the second Babylonian kingdom was like. And then he says, the belly and thighs were of bronze. Now we've got the head and the chest, but now we come the tummy and the thighs. Not the legs, but the upper parts of the legs, the thighs. And this is your third kingdom. And in this particular kingdom, there are two legs. 
And in the two legs, you have two kingdoms that will fall into this bronze category. Turns out gold isn't so good for making weapons. Very heavy, very soft. Silver, not so soft, but not as strong as necessary weapons. But bronze, oh, that's good stuff. That's good for making weapons. And so we have the kingdom now of Alexander the Great. And he will come in in 331 BC and he will conquer Persia. By the age of 33, he will be found drunk by the river, weeping because he had conquered the known world and there are no more worlds to conquer. When he dies, he will be buried with his hands outside the grave, like this, to show that you can take nothing with you. Two thighs of bronze were the two kingdoms that would take over after Alexander dies. Alexander will come in. He will be the most strategic of the generals. He will take over the known world within a few short years. But he will die very young, in his early 30s. After him will come two generals. One known as Seleucus Nicator. And he will form the Seleucid Empire, or the Seleucid Empire. And it will be located in Egypt. There will be some very interesting people come from that line, including, I believe, Cleopatra will be part of that empire. Pardon me, he's in Syria. And then you'll have the Ptolemies. These are the ones that Cleopatra will come from. And this will be Ptolemy uh, Soter. And the kingdom will divide between these two generals, but it'll be bronze. You'll have one in Syria and one in Egypt. Both generals, both inherit the kingdom from Alexander. The two legs, the two thighs. They used bronze exclusively as their weapons. Then you have the legs, which are made of iron. And the thing with iron is that it's, it's the cheapest of the metals which means it's very plentiful. It's the hardest of the metals, and it can be honed to a very sharp cutting edge. And that's Rome. That's who's in charge when Jesus is born. Constantine, Constantine himself uh, dedicated the Eastern capital in 330, by 395 AD, Theodosius divided the empire between his two sons, the eastern and the western kingdoms of Rome, and they still exist today, and you know them. The eastern kingdom of Rome was seated in Turkey, Constantinople. You know it today as the Greek Orthodox Church, or perhaps just the Orthodox Church. It could be Russian, could be Greek. There's a number of them, all the same group coming from the Eastern arm of the Roman Empire. And then you had the Western arm, and that's the one we all know about. That was a huge political machine, and by the way, 
there is a direct line between them and Babylon. I don't want to get into it tonight or I'll get sidetracked. But it's where the term Pontificus Maximus comes from. It comes out of Babylon. You'll have this Western wing. And that will be what we today call the Catholic Church. But at one time, it was more than just a church. It was a political wing, as was the Eastern wing. And there will be war between them constantly as to who's in charge. Is it the Bishop of Constantinople or is it the Pope of Rome? And there will be constant infighting and fighting between the two groups, eventually becoming churches. And today, they still exist. The political power of the Roman Empire is gone. The religious power still exists. And then we have this weird thing. The feet of clay. And that's a very strange thing. I'm going to just put that aside for a moment. I'll come back to it in a couple of minutes. I'm just going to move beyond that. I, I will come back to it in a few seconds, but I want to move beyond it to the stone that destroys everything. Now, as I began to study this through, I noticed that the commentators were trying to tie this together with Mount Zion that rises up and becomes massive. But I don't think that's what this stone is. I don't think this is Mount Zion. I think this is the coming kingdom. I think this is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I think this is Jesus who destroys all of these kingdoms down to literally chaff so that there's utterly nothing left of them. Remember this in Isaiah 28, verse 16. This is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious stone, a cornerstone, a sure foundation, the one that trusts will never be, the one who trusts will never be put to shame or dismayed. I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. Hail will sweep away your refuge and lie, uh, uh, the lie, the water will overflow your hiding place and so on. I lay in Zion a precious stone. And this stone cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. It's, it's a divine thing. Remember when Moses got the Ten Commandments? The first set of Ten Commandments were cut out by the hand of God and written on by the hand of God. Oh, I wish he hadn't dropped those things and broken them. Wouldn't it be something to see God's handwriting? Wouldn't that have been an amazing thing? And incidentally, just in case you're thinking of Charlton Heston and the big old Ten Commandments, here's, a, here's an 80-year-old man coming down a mountain with two massive hunks of stone that none of us could actually pick up in the first place. Rubbish. The Ten Commandments were small, and they fit inside the Ark of the Covenant. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, it says this, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. You're also like living stones and are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable God through Jesus Christ. For the scripture says, See, I lay in Zion a chosen and precious cornerstone of the one that trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, the stone is precious, but those who do not, the stone is the, st the, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. A stone that causes men to st <coughs> stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you've become the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers uh, in this world to abstain from sinful desires which war 
against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits. See, I lay in Zion a precious stone. And the Bible goes on to describe that stone as a hymn. That's why I don't think it's Mount Zion, as many of the commentators teach. I think this stone that's going to blow away the kingdoms of this earth is the same one that's going to come out of Basra covered in blood. The same one that's going to march up to Jerusalem, that's going to ultimately take over and set up his kingdom. And his kingdom will wipe away all of the remnants of these ancient kingdoms. There will be nothing left. Well, let's go back to our passage. Daniel chapter 2, verse 36. This was the dream. And now we'll interpret it for the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are that head of gold. Could you imagine hearing that from the Lord? I know people really love to hear how much God loves them. And it's absolutely the truth. And what an empowering and lovely message it is that Christ would have died if it was just for you. What an amazing thought that the God of all creation, the God of heaven, cares for you. I know they say that even the hairs on your head are numbered. I always felt like that was an easy task on my Imagine what it would be like if he came up to you and it really was God, not a false angel, and he said to you, you're the head of gold. You're the king or queen of kings and queens. In your hands will be placed mankind. The beasts of the field and the birds of the air, wherever they live, you'll rule over them. You are the head of gold. Boy, I tell you, as important. Could you imagine what it would be like to have that kind of power? Not something you usurped, but something God had given you. Real genuine power over the world. You know, they say total power corrupts totally. And I'm not going to tell you to look ahead into next week's chapter. But if you want to see total power at work, in the meantime, turn to Ezekiel chapter 26, verse 1. Ezekiel 26, verse 1. In the eleventh year of the first day of the, of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, that's just a euphemism for human being. Because Tyre has said of Jerusalem, Ah, the gate to the nations is broken, and its doors have swung open to me. And now she lies in ruins. I will prosper. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I am against you, O Tyre, and I will bring many nations against you, like the sea casting up its waves. They will destroy the walls of Tyre and pull down its towers. I will scrape away her rubble and make her a bare rock. Out of the sea, she has become a place to spread fishnets. By the way, Tyre was 
located out in the water. I have spoken, declares the Lord. She will become plunder for the nations and her settlements on the mainland will, have be, will be ravished by the sword. Then you'll know that I'm the Lord. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. From the north, I'm going to bring against Tyre Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. King of kings with horses and chariots, with horsemen and a great army. He will ravage your settlements on, uh, ravel, ravage your settlements on the mainland with the sword, and he will set up a siege that works against you, build a ramp up to your walls, and raise his shields against you. He will direct the blows of his battering rams against your walls and will demolish your towers and his wep with his weapons. His horses will be so many that they will cover you like with dust. Your walls will tremble at the noise of the war horses, wagons and chariots when he enters your gates as men enter a city whose walls have been broken through. The hooves of his horses will trample your streets and he will kill your people with the sword and your strong pillars will fall to the ground. They will plunder your wealth and loot your merchandise. They will break down your walls and demolish your fine houses and throw your stones, timber, and rubble into the sea. And I will put an end to your noisy songs and the music of your harps will be heard no more. And I will make you a bare rock and you'll become a place to spread fishnets. You will never be rebuilt. For I, the Lord, have spoken, declares the sovereign Lord. What you just read is a description of Nebuchadnezzar and God a second time calls him king of kings. What does that actually mean? It means of all the vassals, of all the king nations on the earth, of all the nations that hold a royal family, this one was the top dog. He was the king of the kings. His city was literally covered in gold. You know, we have a couple of places on earth where there are gold domes and they're considered extremely precious because gold doesn't rot. And they're considered historical, amazing, beautiful, stunning, photo worthy, art worthy. But imagine a city covered in gold. And its general, its king, is a young man whose father built it all. But Nebuchadnezzar, when he came in, was just as smart as his dad. He swiped that kingdom away from his brother, and he kept it on an upward trend. And he built it, and he built it, and he built it, till God himself called him king of kings. There's no other king on the earth as smart or wealthy as you and I have put them all under your control. Now, the king of Tyre is giving me a bit of trouble. He's laughing at the fact that Jerusalem's under siege, Jerusalem's under attack, and its gates are broken, and he thinks he's gonna just march in there and rape and pillage the city. So, Nebi, I, I want you to go in there, and I, I want you to utterly destroy him. And God would call him a second time king of kings. Well, that's not an unusual term for us. We, we know that term quite well. Listen to this. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider was called Faithful and True. And the rest didn't print out. That's okay. I know it off by heart. But here's what happens. It comes down to this line. He was the king of kings and, and that title is never given to Nebuchadnezzar. The king of kings and the Lord of lords. 
There are those that will be the king of mankind, kings amongst mankind, but only one that will have all the religious power. That's the Lord of Lords. Now, I told you earlier, I was going to leave the feet and toes to last. I'm going to do that. Back in the early part of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, actually, we have a very interesting conversation between God and Eve. And God says to Eve, thy seed, or pardon me to the devil, thy seed and her seed will be at war. I will put enmity between thy seed and her seed. And I checked this in a number of translations and all of those that are based on the Recept Textus Receptus or the received text, it's clear. It's a war between the seed. The seed of the Lord and the seed of the devil. And when you come to this little passage here in verse 43 of our reading tonight, if I can just find it quickly here. And you saw iron mixed with clay so that the people will be a mixture and not remain united. The actual words here in the Aramaic, and it's not Hebrew, it's Aramaic at this point, are that the seeds or the seed will not mix. Now, there's several ways of interpreting that. Some Bible translators come along and say, well, it's talking about marriages. There'll be, there'll be marriages between various groups, which has been done all the way through history. If you wanted to ensure that there would be peace in your land, you married your kid to the kid of the king next to you, and that way nobody's going to kill anybody. Hopefully. And that's a possible explanation. But there is another explanation which I think might apply here. One of the things that happens to people that claim to have been contacted by UFOs, and there are not hundreds or thousands, there are millions. And if you don't know anything about it, it's because you've chosen not to know about it. And that's okay. You can put your head in the sand as long as you want. But at some point, you're going to have to pull it out and realize that these things are real. They're flying around. They exist. But one of the things that they report is seeing children babies, fetuses on board these craft. And people that are women, particularly, that are regularly abducted report that they see their own children on there, but not human children. Now, with that in mind, we know that there is one coming who is going to be a pseudo-Christ, antichrist. Well, who was Jesus? He was the progeny of God through the Holy Spirit, through Mary, both God and man. So who must the antichrist be? Well, in my opinion, he has got to be the product of the devil and somebody. And how would you accomplish that? Well, it appears that they have been abducting and doing biological experiments on human women now probably for a thousand years. Could this be the iron 
mixed with clay that doesn't adhere, that isn't strong, that falls apart? Could this be the final kingdom? Are we dealing here with the return of the Nephilim from Genesis chapter 6? Is it possible that what we have here is what we are all starting to see now? I don't know if you noticed, but last week there was, what, eight or ten of them came in in formation across the city in the United States and just slowly went over. It was on every single news channel. If you missed it, again, you're willingly missing it. These things are starting to become much more prevalent. And there's so much more depth to this that I'm giving you. I'm giving you the baby version because I don't know where you're at with it. I think what we're going to see here in this final kingdom, final predicted kingdom, is a group that will claim to be alien. They're not alien, they're demonic. There are no aliens, let's be very clear. There are demons that will take on human form as they did in the Nephilim, that will cohabit with women as the Nephilim did, that will produce a man that has superior powers, superior intelligence, su intelligence and superior abilities. He will call fire from heaven. We're going to deal with the Antichrist later on in this book. He's described, I mean, he is really described in this book. It's going to be amazing. In fact, next week, it's going to be absolutely shockingly amazing. We are dipping our toes into future history. Will you bow your heads with me? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that you are in charge of the future, that you have charted it out and you know exactly what's coming next and you are preparing your church and your people and we believe you are coming to take us to be with you. We believe that time is short and in the not too distant future, the eastern skies will open and you will call your church to be with you. And then you will break out against this planet. It will be the day of the Lord, the most horrific time mankind has ever known. And for seven years, the earth will be paid for its treacheries. I thank you, Lord, that you are coming for us and you'll take us to be with you. In Jesus' name, amen.